Good evening. Welcome to tonight's reading from A Princess of Mars, previously titled Under the Moons of Mars, the first book of the Chronicles of Barsoom by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm a Finn J.D. John, and I will be your reader tonight, under the good offices of my institution, the Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds. Chapter 26 Through Carnage to Joy some time later, Tars Tarkas and Kantos Khan returned the report that Zodanga had been completely reduced. Her forces were entirely destroyed or captured, and no further resistance was to be expected from within. Several battleships had escaped, but there were thousands of war and merchant vessels under the guard of Thark warriors. The lesser hordes had commenced looting and quarreling among themselves, so it was decided that we collect what warriors we could, man as many vessels as possible with Zodongan prisoners, and make for Helium without further loss of time. Five hours later we sailed from the roofs of the dock buildings with a fleet of 250 battleships, carrying nearly 100,000 green warriors, followed by a fleet of transports with our thoats. Behind us, we left the stricken city in the fierce and brutal clutches of some 40,000 green warriors of the lesser hordes. They were looting, murdering, and fighting amongst themselves. In a hundred places they had applied the torch, and columns of dense smoke were rising above the city as though to blot out from the eye of heaven the horrid sights beneath. In the middle of the afternoon, we sighted the scarlet and yellow towers of Helium and a short time later a great fleet of Zodongan battleships rose from the camps of the besiegers without the city and advanced to meet us. The banners of Helium had been strung from stem to stern of each of our mighty craft, but the Zodongans did not need to see this sign to realize that we were enemies, for our green Martian warriors had opened fire upon them almost as soon as they left the ground. With their uncanny marksmanship they raked the oncoming fleet with volley after volley. The twin cities of Helium, perceiving that we were friends, sent out hundreds of vessels to aid us, and then began the first real air battle I had ever witnessed. The vessels carrying our green warriors were kept circling above the contending fleets of Helium and Zodanga, since their batteries were useless in the hands of the Tharks, who having no navy have almost no skill in naval gunnery. Their small arm fire, however, was most effective, and the final outcome of the engagement was strongly influenced, if not wholly determined, by their presence. At first the two forces circled at the same altitude, pouring broadside after broadside into each other. Presently a great hole was torn in the hull of one of the immense battlecraft from the Zodangan camp, with a lurch she turned completely over the little figures of her crew plunging, turning, and twisting toward the ground a thousand feet below and then with sickening velocity she tore after them, almost completely burying herself in the soft loam of the ancient sea bottom. A wild cry of exultation arose from the Heliumite squadron, and with redoubled ferocity they fell upon the Zodongan fleet. By a pretty maneuver, two of the vessels of Helium gained a position above their adversaries, from which they poured upon them from their keel bomb batteries a perfect torrent of exploding bombs. Then, one by one, the battleships of Helium succeeded in rising above the Zodongans, and in a short time a number of the beleaguering battleships were drifting, hopeless wrecks, toward the high scarlet tower of Greater Helium. Several others attempted to escape, but they were soon surrounded by thousands of tiny individual flyers, and above each hung a monster battleship of Helium, ready to drop a boarding party upon their decks. Within but little more than an hour from the moment the victorious Zodongan squadron had risen to meet us from the camp of the besiegers, the battle was over, and the remaining vessels of the conquered Zodongans were headed toward the cities of Helium under prize crews. There was an extremely pathetic side to the surrender of these mighty flyers, the result of an age-old custom that demanded that surrender should be signalized by the voluntary plunging to earth of the commander of the vanquished vessel. One after another, the brave fellows, holding their colors high above their heads, leaped from the towering bows of their mighty craft to an awful death. Not until the commander of the entire fleet took the fearful plunge, thus indicating the surrender of the remaining vessels, did the fighting cease, and the useless sacrifice of brave men come to an end. We now signaled the flagship of Helium's navy to approach, and when she was within hailing distance I called out that we had the Princess Stasia Thoris on board, and that we wished to transfer her to the flagship, that she might be taken immediately to the city. 
As the full import of my announcement bore in on them, a great cry arose from the decks of the battleship, and a moment later the colors of the Princess of Helium broke from a hundred points upon her upper works. When the other vessels of the squadron caught the meaning of the signals flashed them, they took up the wild acclaim and unfurled her colors in the gleaming sunlight. The flagship bore down on us, and as she swung gracefully to and touched our side, a dozen officers sprang upon our decks. As their astonished gaze fell upon the hundreds of green warriors who now came forth from the fighting shelters, they stopped aghast, but at the sight of Kantos Khan, who advanced to meet them, they came forward, crowding about him. Deja Thoris and I then advanced, and they had no eyes for other than her. She received them gracefully, calling each by name, for they were men high in the esteem and service of her grandfather, and she knew them well. "'Lay your hands upon the shoulder of John Carter,' she said to them, turning toward me. "'The man to whom Helium owes her princess as well as her victory today.' They were very courteous to me, and said many kind and complimentary things, but what seemed to impress the most was that I had won the aid of the fierce Tharks in my campaign for the liberation of Dejah Thoris, and the relief of Helium. "'You owe your thanks more to another man than to me,' I said, "'and here he is. Meet one of Barsoom's greatest soldiers and statesmen, Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark.' With the same polished courtesy that had marked their manner toward me, they extended their greetings to the great Thark, nor, to my surprise, was he much behind them in ease of bearing or in courtly speech. Though not a garrulous race, the Tharks are extremely formal, and their ways lend themselves amazingly to dignified and courtly manners. Dejah Thoris went aboard the flagship, and was much put out that I would not follow, but, as I explained to her, the battle was only partly won, we still had the land forces of the besieging Zodongans to account for, and I would not leave Tars Tarkas until this had been accomplished. The commander of the naval forces of Helium promised to arrange to have the armies of Helium attack from the city in conjunction with our land attack, and so the vessels separated and Dejah Thoris was borne in triumph back to the court of her grandfather, Tardus Mors. Jeddak of Helium. In the distance lay our fleet of transports, with the thoats of the green warriors where they had remained during the battle. Without landing stages it was to be a difficult matter to unload these beasts upon the open plain, but there was nothing else for it, and so we put out for a point about ten miles from the city and began the task. It was necessary to lower the animals to the ground in slings, and this work occupied the remainder of the day and half the night. Twice we were attacked by parties of Zodangan cavalry, but with little loss, and after darkness shut down, they withdrew. As soon as the last thoat was unloaded, Tars Tarkas gave the command to advance, and in three parties we crept upon the Zodangan camp from the north, the south, and the east. About a mile from the main camp, we encountered their outpost, and, as had been prearranged, accepted this as the signal to charge. With wild, ferocious cries and amidst the nasty squealing of battle-enraged thoats, we bore down upon the Zodangans. We did not catch them napping, but found a well-entrenched battle line confronting us. Time after time we were repulsed until toward noon I began to fear for the result of the battle. The Zodongans numbered nearly a million fighting men gathered from pole to pole wherever stretched their ribbon-like waterways, while pitted against them were less than a hundred thousand green warriors. The forces from Helium had not arrived, nor could we receive any word from them. Just at noon we heard heavy firing all along the line between the Zodongans and the cities, and we knew then that our much-needed reinforcements had come. Again Tars Tarkas ordered the charge, and once more the mighty thoats bore their terrible riders against the ramparts of the enemy. At the same moment the battle line of Helium surged over the opposite breastworks of the Zodongans, and in another moment they were being crushed in between as two millstones. Nobly they fought, but in vain. The plain before the city became a veritable shambles ere the last Zodongan surrendered, but finally the carnage ceased. The prisoners were marched back to Helium, and we entered the greater city's gates, a huge triumphal procession of conquering heroes. The broad avenues were lined with women and children, among which were the few men whose duties necessitated that they remain within the city during the battle. We were greeted with an endless round of applause, and showered with ornaments of gold, platinum, silver, and precious jewels. The city had gone mad with joy. My fierce tharks caused the wildest excitement and enthusiasm. Never before had an armed body of green warriors entered the gates of Helium, and that they came now as friends and allies filled the red men with rejoicing. 
that my poor services to Dejah Thoris had become known to the Heliumites was evidenced by the loud crying of my name and by the loads of ornaments that were fastened upon me and my huge thoat as we passed up the avenues to the palace. For even in the face of the ferocious appearance of Woola, the populace pressed close about me. As we approached this magnificent pile, we were met by a party of officers who greeted us warmly and requested that Tars Tarkas and his Jeds and the Jeddux and Jeds of his wild allies, together with myself, dismount and accompany them to receive from Tardis Moors an expression of gratitude for our services. At the top of the great steps leading up to the main portals of the palace stood the royal party, and as we reached the lower steps, one of their number descended to meet us. He was an almost perfect specimen of manhood, tall, straight as an arrow, superbly muscled, and with the carriage and bearing of a ruler of men. I did not need to be told that he was Tardis Mors, Jeddak of Helium. The first member of our party he met was Tars Tarkas, and his first words sealed forever the new friendship between the races. The Tardos Mors, he said earnestly, may meet the greatest living warrior of Barsoom as a priceless honor, but that he may lay his hand on the shoulder of a friend and ally is a far greater boon. Jeddak of Helium, returned Tars Tarkas, it has remained for a man of another world to teach the green warriors of Barsoom the meaning of friendship. To him we owe the fact that the hordes of Thark can understand you, that they can appreciate and reciprocate the sentiments so graciously expressed. Tardos Mors then greeted each of the green Jeddaks and Jeds, and to each spoke words of friendship and appreciation. As he approached me, he laid both hands upon my shoulders. Welcome, my son, he said, that you were granted gladly and without one word of opposition the most precious jewel in all helium, yes, on all Barsoom, is sufficient earnest of my esteem. We were then presented to Mors Kojak, Jed of Lesser Helium and the father of Dejah Thoris. He had followed close behind Tardis Morse and seemed even more affected by the meeting than his father. He tried a dozen times to express his gratitude to me, but his voice choked with emotion and he could not speak. And yet he had, as I was to learn later, a reputation for ferocity and fearlessness as a fighter that was remarkable even upon warlike Barsoom. In common with all helium, he worshipped his daughter, nor could he think of what she had escaped without deep emotion. That's the end of today's reading. We'll continue tomorrow with the next chapter of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Text copyright 1912 by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This reading copyright 2014 by Finn J.D. John. More information about this project is at von-junst.org. That's V-O-N-J-U-N-Z-T. Good night, and I wish you interest.